My name is Gus Gazard um, from Moorfields Eye Hospital, Director of the Glaucoma Service there and also at uh, U UCL University College London Institute of Ophthalmology here in London. We've got some excellent speakers lined up for you this evening. Uh, Faisal Ahmed from the Western Eye Hospital here in London, Professor David Crabb from the Crabb Lab at City University in London, myself briefly, and Francesco Adone from uh, the uh, Eye Hospital in Rome. Um, speaking to us from Italy. So I'm looking forward to our uh, discussions. Uh, we will try to uh, keep our content brief enough that we have some time to answer your questions where possible. There's quite a lot to get through because there's some um, really excellent material in the talks that I've um, just previewed. I'm really looking forward to um, a very informative evening. So without more ado, we will move on to our first speaker. Uh, Faisal Ahmed, and he's uh, introducing us to the ideas of disaster mitigation, uh, particularly what we can try and do in the climate of COVID to save as much sight as possible with the limitations the current environment is putting on us. Thank you very much. Over to you, Faisal. Thanks very much, Gus. So I'm going to talk about disaster response with regards to COVID-19 and try and use a bit of my non-ophthalmology experience working in a humanitarian charity uh, with disasters. So the UN uh, defined a disaster as a serious disruption or functioning of community society involving widespread losses and impacts which exceed the ability of the community to cope. On the right hand side, you have a picture of uh, the Boxing Day, uh, Boxing Day um, tsunami that happened in 2004 with pictures before and after the tsunami hit the Indonesian islands. So we have to move on quite quickly. We only have 12 minutes for this, but essentially disasters are categorized into levels one, two, and three, where level one disasters are uh, dealt with locally with people on the ground. Level two require regional help, and level three are the large scale disasters such as tsunami disaster where external assistance was required. So in disasters in their, in their characteristics are very very different one earthquake disaster is not the same as another one on the top left hand side again this picture of uh, indonesia uh, next to it is the pakistan earthquake where 80,000 people unfortunately lost their lives F far right hand side is uh, sierra leone where uh, we were helping to manage uh, people in sierra leone during the ebola crisis um, and so you can see with all these different disasters, there are different ways of responding. And you can see on the top right hand corner again, the medical team wearing their PPE kit, which I'm sure there apparently there are some units still in England who require PPE. On the bottom right hand side, um, there is our team working in close proximity without PPE in the earthquake environment, which happened in Pakistan. So as you see, they're all slightly different and the response and the teams are all slightly different as well. So when responding to a disaster, it's very important that you have clear objectives about what your medical team is going to do. No different really to what you do in your own hospital, but making clear objectives is how you're going to achieve it. So it's important that we obviously we treat our patients in a timely manner. And this is a clinical timely man manner rather than, for instance, in the UK, where we run on uh, referred treatment time and we have to stick with within the times the uh, general practitioners give us and national guidelines are. But when we a sent a patient and when by which time we have to treat them. So during the disaster time, that goes completely out the window. It's completely done on not RTT, but NTT, need to treat. And of course, within disaster, we have to maintain good patient relationship, uh, maintain team safety, which is done for us. We take that for granted in our normal day-to-day -day lives within the hospital, but we're more aware of that when the disaster setting. Treatments are, are modified when you're in a disaster to try and see if we can make them more efficient and quicker uh, and have people uh, operated on less. Of course, we have to maintain a very high level of professionals at all times. And unfortunately, when you're in a disaster, you do have to prepare for losses. And again, that's something that um, is not necessarily something people think of all the time. I put this slide up purely to show you that on the bottom right hand side, there are firefighters fighting the fire. But unfortunately, they're about to be uh, injured with that wall on the left hand side falling on top of them. So that's something that really needs to be looked into when we're doing dealing with disaster response. 
And there are phases of disaster response in regards to preparation, response, and recovery. So the preparation phase is where you do the planning. You plan to respond to a disaster before it happens. It's a critical stage of disaster response. You look at what uh, events may happen, what sort of injuries are going to happen. This is where you put in your data of the type of injuries, where the incident's going to happen, access to your incident, availability of resources, and so on. You can then model the equipment required. Um, for instance, in this COVID time, we, we should have known how much PPE was required. Um, and we also look into training. So you can train through the scenarios with the new equipment that you may not be familiar with. And in a disaster environment, this is taking medical teams who are used to uh, dealing with patients all the time, but training them up to be able to be independent in an austere environment, used to slightly different equipment, but trying to still have that professionalism and treat patients in the best way they can. And my job within my uh, charity, Humanity First, was to make sure that people were as prepared as they were. You then go on to the response phase, where again, data, information about what's happening is important. The real-time information is important, so you can then respond accordingly with the adequate resources required. And then you move on to the actual patient treatment by the clin clinical team. Triage is important because, again, needing to treat patients at the right time is key to how, how we solve the situation of a disaster response. Treatment and referral pathways. And then, of course, you have the recovery, preparation, debrief, and you go back to modifying your planning again. So what were the key lessons? Again, we've only got short lessons. So the key lessons were one, we had to put our own course together um, so that we can train clinicians as to how to respond in an austere environment and not be part of the problem, but be the part of the solution. So they had to be completely independent. And we set a course up and eventually uh, the UK government um, uh, allowed us to run their first course for them um, about 2013. And uh, it's it's fun uh, trying to uh, tell off orthopedic surgeons how to do their job while screaming at them, trying to distract them. Uh, and, and, you know, we have moulages and actors playing injured and so on. So that's all good. The key lessons, I guess, from disaster, from my experience of disaster response, I, I put in a mnemonic, which I just made up a few hours ago, DOCS. So data, you need the information to be able to respond. You need to have good organization and communication skills within your disaster team, as well as, L, as, well as communication with all the agents who are working in that disaster. And there has to be a coordinating system for that as well. That, that your team has to be safe, because if they're not safe, again, you're part of the disaster. And you have to, again, show compassion. There's no point being in disaster and saying, well, I'm going to lose all my bed mannerisms and, and treat people like robots. That's just not acceptable. So coming to the COVID-19 COVID issue, so WHO uh, defined uh, COVID-19 as a pandemic on the 11th of March 2020. At that stage, there were only, I say only, there are 118,000 118, cases, over 4,000 deaths in over 100 countries. At the end of April, we'd already had 3 million cases and over 200,000 deaths. And of course, we all know with our daily updates that are happening that uh, the UK is not doing very well. But overall, um, the numbers are still going up and there are secondary waves of infection as well. So what did we do at the Western Eye? I'll give you a brief sign up to what happened at the Western Eye. So middle of March, we were suddenly told that we're not going to have face to face appointments, that we're going to be doing mostly phone calls. And the only face to face we would see are the very, very high risk emergency patients. For instance, today um, I had 11 face to face appointments with with patients. And you see the numbers are roughly about the same of face to face and phone calls. In fact, there are mo more phone calls. Um, so the, with regards to patient communication, we kept that up with all the telecommunication we had. But of course, we're leaving ourselves with, a, with the deal of looking and fitting in these extra thousand patients per month that are happening just in the glaucoma service. And with regards to surgery, we tried to look at an emergency surgi surgical plan, which took into account the fact that we were going to lose our anaesthetists and lose theatres very quickly. So we quickly pulled and triaged all our surgical patients to make sure the ones who were time dependent uh, are going to lose their sight very quickly were operated on soon. So we pulled the patients 
Uh, we had to weigh up whether we could operate them versus their risk of COVID-19 and push some patients back on oral acetazolamide. We also looked at the surgical procedures we performed and the management pathways that we had. For instance, in, angle, in chronic angle closures, we were offering patients uh, phaco surgery rather than a PI. But in this case, we just did PIs on, on, on anyone who was acute coming in um, and temporized them and try and reduce the, the impact of doing surgery that involved aerosolizing procedures. Also reducing and in fact stopping all our GAs pretty much and going on to local with sedations at most and changing the type of tubes perhaps we were doing. And also looking at MDLT, which is micropulse, as I keep getting corrected, micropulse cyclophotocoagulation, not MDLT. And we did publish um, uh, a paper on that in the last six months, uh, showing our early results on that, which are very promising on the recalcitrant glaucomas. So anyway, so we have this situation now where even within the Western Eye Hospital, we are pushing back seeing a thousand patients a month in the glaucoma service alone. So we have this on the left hand side, huge tsunami, secondary tsunami, which we are suffering in the uh, hospitals and services that do chronic disease where we haven't been able to see our patients. And somehow we have to turn that tsunami of thousands of patients that need to be seen into smaller waves that are manageable. Otherwise, of course, that big tsunami is going to wipe us out. So again, we're in the same disaster situation where we have to keep clear aims and making sure that we're treating patients according to the clinical risk and not the RTT time required by government. And that, of course, the team is maintained with their safety and that we can maximize the work we can do. So there are various triaging systems that have been brought up. The Royal College of Ophthalmology in the UK have put one up. AAO, the American Academy, have also put uh, triaging systems where they've defined which patients need to be treated and seen and operated on sooner than others. So there tends to be a RAG rating. What we say RAG rating is red, amber, green, and there are various modifications of this. Of course, there's a famous song, all we need is love, but I would add and data. So in disaster response, as I said before, data is really key to how you respond because you need to know what your problem is in order to give an answer. And that's a issue we've always known since we were children. And so I'm just going to load up the Excel spreadsheet that uh, Medisoft have very kindly made up this week, literally. And I have to thank Melanie Dodds of Heidelberg, who's put this spreadsheet together for me. So what we've done is we've uh, been using Medisoft for over 10 years now. And what we have here in front of us is a spreadsheet of all the patients who have diabetic macular edema. And um, within that information, oops, what we can do is look at the patient and say, OK, well, which patients have lost over two lines of vision since their last visit? So I can pop that out, press one, and that will tell me all the patients have lost over two ETDRS lines. I can look at all on the right hand column here, patients who we've roughly categorized into uh, they meet s driving requirements in the UK. They don't meet driving requirements. They can be registered as partially sighted or they can be registered as fully um, severe sight impaired. And if I go along my spreadsheet, we can look at the times they were last seen and when their next planned visits are, as well as look at the diagnosis. All of this information will then be collated so that it will help drive us as to what's happening in our services. And um, if I briefly, as quickly as I can, show you, we've done the same uh, I had a quick look at, for instance, fast progressors in glaucoma with David Crabb's visual field audit tool, and we've modified it. So we've added in vision loss as well. So those patients who not only have a high rate of mean deviation loss in their visual fields, but also those who lost vision on their acuity. And if we go on to the right hand side, we've got the diagnosis, uh, the number of glaucoma medications they're on. And all of this data will help us drive and, and be a smart way of risk categorizing patients, not by purely their diagnosis, but also actually their functional vision, i.e. their functional visual acuity and their functional visual fields. So let's just go back to the talk. 
So that means we can risk categorize a bit smarter now. We can put in the factors of functional rate loss, whether they've got high IOP at the last visit and how much medication they're on. We can risk categorize, our, for instance, our glaucoma patients. It will help model our new service regards to what the surgical list will be like and what our clinic list will be like over time. However, we have to put in to we have to take into account the fact that we don't necessarily have the data and these spreadsheets will also tell us the data we don't know on our patients. So docs, as I said before, data, organization, communication, compassion, safety, key to the way we respond in this COVID-19 disaster. So at the Western, I'm just going to quickly put this through. So at the Western, we'll be looking at remodeling our service with regards to using the data that we now have. And I've got a service meeting tomorrow, so hopefully my leads are all looking in at what we'll talk about tomorrow. The, the spreadsheets allow us to risk categorize our patients, not only into whether they go to consultant led clinics because they're high risk or into the monitoring service, which is for the low risk, or whether they go into the community or are seen by opticians in the community. In addition, the diagnosis we have, we can then see which patients need to be seen in a multidisciplinary team. And we can remodel the whole service. And on the right hand side, well, we're never going to have 82 patients in clinic again, thank God, because we have social distancing. So we have. Uh, we have to stick to that social distancing, so we'll never have that overbooked clinic. And this remodeling will also allow us to look at new ways of investigating patients, which may be safer than current models at the moment. So from tears come lessons. So the main driving point here is that we have to go on clinical outcome and not RTT and other, um, of other measures that are not really useful in this particular time that unlike other disasters where we're only trying to restore services we can actually try and use this opportunity to improve our service reconfigure them and make them safer make sure the patients aren't in multiple clinics within our hospital but in a, a joint multidisciplinary clinic and of course i'm going to be wearing this mask stuff for for a long time yet thanks very much uh, everyone and be safe uh, just to say that you know without friends and colleagues working with you uh, disaster response is awful Thanks very much indeed, Faisal. That was a great overview of uh, a view from disaster relief and a, a view from the Western. Uh, we'll now be moving on to Professor David Cram, who I'm sure needs no introduction to most of you. Uh, however, he is the professor uh, in the um, Statistics and Vision Research Lab, the Crab Lab at City University, uh, responsible for um, some of the most memorable <laughs> talks and uh, most memorable graphics for all, that have um, come out of glaucoma and certainly psychophysics research from the last decade. And I'm looking forward to hearing about how we can do our fi visual fields from our armchairs in the era of COVID when we have social distancing, perhaps the ultimate social distancing in our armchair at home with a glass of wine. Thank you, David. Thanks uh, so much, Gus. That's uh, a really uh, nice introduction. And um, also I'd like to um, thank um, Heidelberg as well for uh, inviting me to uh, make this contribution indeed from my armchair as it turns out. So um, um, I'm just skip this first slide here because in the interest of time, I I'm talking about the burden of glaucoma and obviously um, from my non-clinical point of view, the real burden of glaucoma lies um, first and foremost with the patient and the patient families. But uh, this evening I really want to talk about the burden that's associated with the health service that has to look after uh, the patients. And it was about 10 years ago that we did this back of a cigarette um, uh, calculation to say that there was there's over a million hospital visits for glaucoma every year. And uh, we know this is an age related condition. Uh, we know about the fact that the demographics are changing and therefore this isn't going to be a problem that goes away. We're just going to have more and more patients. And I guess uh, in these current times, COVID or post-COVID, uh, we know that this, this issue is, become, is going to become uh, even more extreme and come under the microscope further. So what do we do with all of these patients? Well, there's an obsession in the glaucoma clinic with intraocular pressure. And I call it an obsession because uh, we did a study on this a few years ago where we looked at 11 different clinics in uh, England and Wales. And uh, in that study, we showed that any kind of decision about intensifying treatment or um, increasing the number of times a patient would come into a clinic was always driven by intraocular pressure. Of course, it's a healthy obsession because intraocular pressure is the uh, only modifiable risk factor for the, uh, for the disease. 
But, um, and although we're getting much better at maybe quickly looking at the optic nerve in terms of OCT, it was apparent in that study that decisions uh, were, were always or typically made based on intraocular pressure. The main point I guess I want to make this evening is that um, what I think is that the most important uh, measure that we should be taking when we're monitoring patients with glaucoma uh, is using automated perimetry. After all, the visual field is the, the measure that tells us something about um, the patient's function. It tells us about how glaucoma is affecting their sight. So my, my main point this evening is to say that automated perimetry is a critical component of following patients with glaucoma. Then again, anyone who knows me would turn around to me and say, well, you would say that because that's my research interest. And uh, I'm not like a normal person, uh, like all of you listening here. I'm someone who's interested in perimetry from a research point of view. In fact, um, I belong to something called the International Perimetry Society, where every two years we get together and believe it or not, over two or three days, all we do, do is talk about, uh, about perimetry. Uh, but like any academic meeting, it often ends up um, like a big party, really. But anyway, it's not just me who thinks perimetry is important because, again, this is a bit more evidence. This was a study that we did a few years ago where we um, asked uh, specialists and subspecialists in glaucoma to sort of rank the importance of the measurements that they take in the clinic. And they all agreed about the importance of measuring visual function using perimetry, but at the same time said how difficult it was. The other part of this slide sort of makes the point that if we're going to develop a clinical trial for looking at treatments of glaucoma, then we have to consider visual function as the main uh, outcome measure as well. So perimetry is definitely important, but what about the real experts? What do the real experts think? Now, the real experts are the people who have been pressing the button all these years, really. Uh, that is your patients that do perimetry. And this was a nice study that was done by Fiona Glenn in 2014, where she basically interviewed and had a focus group with a series of patients looking at how, what they felt uh, was important in terms of their glaucoma monitoring. And you won't be surprised to know that they found visual field and perimetry the most challenging aspect of their monitoring. Many of these patients talked about the good experience that they had with perimetry, and often it was associated with good supervision and being in the right kind of environment. But something that I, I took from this study, which I thought was particularly interesting, is how few patients actually saw their visual field charts. So we're asking patients to do something called a visual field examination, and yet it seems many patients never really see the results of that examination. Um, so can we can we do something better with perimetry? And um, I kind of regret putting a big red cross on the Humphrey perimeter there because I don't think we should kind of move away from this, this standard that we have had in our clinic for 25 or 30 years. But we need to start thinking about ways in which we can supplement it or augment it. Uh, there are portable tests that are available for assessing the visual field. And uh, there are other ways in which we might be able to measure the visual field without asking a, 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 a patient to press a button, for example. So eye movement perimetry. So in the last couple of years, we've tried to combine these two things. And uh, this, this rejoices under the, the name of eye catcher. And the idea here is we are developing uh, a portable perimeter that can be run on a tablet based um, uh, machine using um, an, an eye tracker, the type of eye tracker that's used in, in gaming technology, so a very inexpensive eye tracker. And um, without going into too much detail about how this uh, uh, works, essentially there's no button. Uh, the patient just moves their eye to try and find this uh, fixed uh, intensity stimulus. And then we use the eye tracker to work out the starting point of the gaze to the end point when the stimulus is seen or not seen. And so the stimulus re remains consistent so it's like a fast, so-called supra-threshold test of the visual field. And we've done some nice work on this. Uh, this was primarily done by Nicholas Smith and then followed up by Pete Jones. And we published the paper in TVST, uh, I think it was about 18 months ago. And we showed that there was very good concordance between this very fast, rapid test of the visual field compared with the kind of reference standard, which is the, the Humphrey visual field. But if you look at the literature, you can find lots of papers like this where people have come up with their own kind of new visual field test. The important thing is how does this actually work in the real world? So our next step was actually to take this into the real world. And the idea was to actually test people while they're actually in their uh, uh, um, in the waiting room of the glaucoma clinics. So, so what we did is we actually tested people using this uh, new uh, um, uh, tablet-based 
portable perimeter in uh, the uh, the waiting room. And the real world, uh, you may not know, but the real world is actually Guildford. It is Guildford. And the head of the real world is Dan Linfield. So I'd just like to credit Dan Linfield because he was our collaborator on this study. And basically what we did is we uh, we measured about, uh, well, 78 people in the glaucoma clinic, consecutive patients, random cross-section, and got them to do this test uh, literally in the waiting room. And I'll just show, share some of the results. So here's a patient here with a, um, a, a, a relatively early visual field defect, a nasal step. And these are the eye catcher results. The red areas represent where the defect is. Uh, this graph shows that we're only measuring a certain part of the visual field. So we're only uh, measuring the sort of central 15 degrees. And on a second run of the test, yeah, it was repeatable as well. Um, here's another example here. I hope the bills are, are working okay. Uh, this is a patient with a more advanced visual field loss. And again, the portable test picked it up quite nicely. Uh, here's a patient who's lost all their vision in their um, uh, inferior visual field. And again, we've managed to capture that with eye catcher. This is an interesting example because this is a typical patient. Well, they're not a patient. This is a false referral. So this is someone who's come into the clinic that's been falsely referred. Their vision is probably better than mine. And what uh, eye catcher shows is that they also have a normal visual field. So this, this was very promising. And um, this uh, graph, I'm not going to go into details. This is a very complicated graph. But essentially what we showed is by using this fast portable test, we could actually um, detect um, visual field loss at a level of minus six decibels MD um, with reasonably good sensitivity and specificity. And this is a complicated graph, but I want you to focus on that big green area over there. If you look in that big green space, you'll see that there are no patients. So what did this mean? This meant that if they passed the eye catcher test, it meant that they didn't have any visual field loss. So this is really kind of quite useful because this sort of points to the idea that you could give these tablet based portable tests to people in the waiting room and you could get an idea about whether they have visual field loss or not or whether they needed further examination using the Humphrey. So what I'm clumsily getting at really is that this would be a very useful sort of triage tool. And also when we ask patients about, you know, how they felt doing the test that, you know, they were a lot happier and found the test easier to perform and um, you know, and found it quite an enjoyable kind of easy test to, to do. The downside, the caveat is that it didn't work in eight eyes, which doesn't sound that many, but that's around about 10% of our small sample. But again, I guess in a triad situation, if someone, uh, if the test didn't really work, and the reason it doesn't work is because sometimes the uh, the actual eye tracker uh, doesn't actually work. It's a very cheap eye tracker. So in a way, this would be again uh, a, a way of sort of triaging patients. As, as they sit in the clinic. Uh, I just want to get on to the sort of the main part of this talk or the main final part, and that is, you know, can we start to take some of this technology perhaps into patients' homes? And this is a study that we've been doing for about the last 18 months. It was funded by the International Glaucoma Association. And I should point out two critical people here, Pete Campbell and Tamsin Callahan. And this is my uh, colleague, Dave Edgar and Pete Jones. So that, that's the team that's been working on this project. And um, I would say that what we're doing here is we're taking uh, almost a Dell Boy approach to perimetry. And what I mean by that is we're trying to fake the Humphrey in this kind of test. So the test that we have now no longer has an eye tracker. We're back to using a button. Um, and we're actually trying to mimic or fake a Humphrey test, a full threshold test. So we're trying to get measurements at every single point. And the, uh, the, the uh, portable device that we use or the tablet device that we can use is a particularly inexpensive device. So if you went to Argos this evening, you could go and buy one of these for um, 300 pounds. And this is what the test looked like. So this is the Humphrey down here, and these are the eye catcher results. And you can see that we're doing our very best to fake exactly what the Humphrey looks like. But it's not all kind of Del Boy. There's some Star Wars as well. So Pete Jones, uh, we're just about to publish this paper in TVST, and this is where he's been using the webcam, not the eye tracker, but the actual ordinary webcam that's built into your laptop to actually monitor the compliance or adherence of a patient as they're doing this, this particular test. And the study is quite interesting. We got 20 people, 20 volunteers. They started by coming into the university where we did an assessment on them. So they did two visual fields at the start of the study and then two visual fields at the end. We gave them the eye catcher device and they did the, the, the eye catcher test uh, once a month 
for, for uh, six months. And I guess what's going to be the most useful output from this study is going to be the structured interview that we do with these patients. Because when we talk about trying to do home monitoring, it's not just the technology that we use, but we need to kind of interrogate the human factors uh, uh, as well. And uh, this is uh, the big achievement, I think, from this particular study is that we gave 20 of these devices to 20 people and they took them home and they did the study and we actually got 20 back and nothing broke and nothing didn't work. And I'm just going to share uh, some of the data because we're quite excited about this. This is for four patients. This is their Humphrey at the start and the Humphrey at the end. And uh, these are the uh, eye catcher uh, HFA fields in between. And here they are for some other patients. And if you look at these, you can see that there's a reasonably good concordance. Uh, we also show that the MD values that we take from the, uh, the eye catcher device are also uh, highly associated or agree very carefully with the, uh, uh, with the Humphrey values. And I just want to um, spend a little tiny bit more time on this graph because this graph here um, represents the amount of um, uh, variability that there might be between do doing two Humphrey tests. So we're six months apart. So this would be the kind of level of variability that we would see in a clinical situation if we were in the position of just doing a Humphrey once every six months. Perhaps if we were doing a clinical trial, we would do more Humphrey tests. So this is a situation where you do two Humphrey tests at baseline and two Humphrey tests at, um, at follow-up. And you can see that the variability has been minimized. But what we're quite excited about is this is the level of variability that one would get purely because you're actually testing people more frequently. So we think that there could be particular advantages in using this, uh, this device that patients could take to, at home to augment the, uh, the perimetry that they're doing in the clinic. And these are not our patients, but perhaps it gives us favor of what, uh, what could be possible if our patients could do these tests at home. And also points to some of the comedy that we might see when we start looking at the webcam results. Now, I'm very aware that I've uh, overrun time there, so I'll leave my thanks uh, uh, to, the, to the screen here and point out if anybody's interested in sort of following any of our research, then you can find us on the web and um, on, on Twitter as well. And just finally, to uh, thank everybody for listening tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, David. That was, uh, as expected, a, a tour de force tour of what may well be coming to us and our armchairs. Uh, in the next year or two, well, hopefully in the next uh, few months, if we're lucky. Um, certainly, we don't yet know what the current future for traditional visual field testing is in the COVID environment. A few questions coming in about that, but generally speaking, we don't know. So uh, thank you very much, David. I'm sure there'll be a lot of um, questions later around uh, the two uh, different models of, of testing that you were describing, the button, the eye catcher tracker. Um, I'd like now to move on um, and I'd like to talk about glaucoma treatment. Um, paradigms is a grand word, but glaucoma treatment in the post light era. And essentially what I'm going to do is, is briefly introduce some thoughts to uh, talk uh, briefly about a couple of ideas around what may um, influence our decisions these days around uh, glaucoma treatments. Uh, briefly describe the light trial and then probably uh, wrap it up there because we've got a short of time and I'd like to make sure that we've got some time for questions. So uh, funding acknowledgements, as always, I'm partially funded, uh, largely funded by the NIHR Health Technology Assessment Grant, um, but also uh, other funding bodies, including not um, restricted to Fight for Sight, uh, the IGA, College Ophthalmology, um, British Council for Prevention of Blindness, and thanks to all of those. And I'd like, I'd like to kick off with actually is a, is a David Crabb paper uh, that reminds us about how long our patients are going to live, their residual life expectancy after their diagnosis of glaucoma. And um, this might be a, a bit of a sobering thought that uh, some of our patients may go on to live as long as 30 or 40 years, given their rate of visual field loss. But the median um, for these patients is around 16 years. So for most of our patients, we're looking for 16 to 20 uh, years of pressure control, and for a smaller number, slightly longer than that, years of pressure control to try and prevent their visual field loss. And within the group of retrospectively examined visual fields um, of these patients, there were very large numbers with very small 
rates of uh, change and mean deviation year by year. And what I think this means we need to do is really, what I take away from this is that we really need to focus our attentions on those patients who are down here at the left hand tail um, with very rapid rates of visual field loss and make sure that we're focusing our attentions on those, but not inflicting uh, too much pain, suffering or excess treatment. I mean, in that I would include too many excess visits on the bulk that are here in the middle who with adequate pressure control change very little. So it really is a lesson that I've said in a, a post light trial paradigm era, but actually it's also in a post COVID era, the idea of uh, less is more and the least possible intervention and the fewest possible numbers of attendances at hospital will become critically important for these patients, given that there is a small but real risk of, of life threatening infection in our elderly at risk age group patients. Or we expect at least several years to come. So. On that note, we need to think about rates of visual field loss leading to disability. What can uh, we aim to do to stop the very rapid, very fast progressors of minus two decibels a year here, uh, We to convert them to a slow, but um, functionally and quality of life insignificant rate of deterioration in this green line here. If we're not careful, the immediate complications such as hemorrhage, from surgery can rapidly blind a patient. Late complications such as blebitis from trabeculectomy can rapidly blind a patient. And we need to factor in all of these different rates of vis potential vision loss um, um, in our risk assessment and risk ratio balance. Now the risk can be considered the chance of event given the harm from event, something that's extremely rare, uh, but extremely harmful is likely to alter our practice as much as something that's very mild, but very frequent, and possibly more so. The rate of foreign body sensation after a trabeculectomy is very common, and we often discount it, although it does have an impact on quality of life. Whereas endophthalmitis is potentially very blinding, but after trabeculectomy at least extremely rare. And there's a, there's a risk benefit um, assessment for both of these that changes over time, that changes over the duration of potential exposure, and that changes over the duration of the patient's life. And we have to remember that randomized control trials, even the longer trials of three or six year follow up, are in the context of the patient's expected remaining lifetime from diagnosis, short term, and also less good for detecting rare or late events. Infrequent events, don't pop up very often in randomized controlled trials, and you certainly don't have enough data to be able to predict their frequency or predict their risk factors. And what we really need to do is be determining the number of needed to harm in very large patient populations. And that's hopefully where some of the real world data that um, we heard Faisal talking about gathering in Medisoft, and hopefully we'll um, touch upon with Francesco's um, talk later, will come into play because the real world data in very large numbers may be able to give us some of that information that's missing even from well-conducted randomized controlled trials. And lastly, even when we have the data, the benefits, harms and likelihoods of these are very differently perceived by different doctors. There's a confirmation bias around what we already expect. Um, there are our own um, personal experiences of benefits, harms and probabilities. And we've seen that most recently in individuals experience of COVID um, having a very profound impact on doctors' appreciation of risk across the UK in the discussions that we've had around opening up our services again. Those in very less affected areas are somewhat less concerned about infection risk than those who have been in hospitals with sadly very high death rates. So where does that take us in terms of the light trial? Well, hospital statistics, even before the light trial um, was published in 2019, showed that there were the rapidly increasing attendances for laser trabeculoplasty. So a lot more people having laser trabeculoplasty across the country. Clearly, there's a changing environment there um, and, a, and a, a, a shift away from um, the standard medication, preserved medication use across the country. We also have greater information now from randomized controlled trials showing that um, IOP reduction 
with a number of um, uh, non-invasive, minimally invasive glaucoma surgeries are better able to control intraocular pressure, giving us additional pressure lowering above and beyond cataract surgery alone. So a lot of patients who were previously on treatment undergoing cataract surgery are now in some randomized trials and some series able to become drop free as in as many as um, 75 to 80 percent of cases in some of the Hydra studies of mild to moderate disease predominantly treated with one or two medications preoperatively. So that's a very exciting shift in the world that we're entering and the, some of the evidence for shifting towards a, a low drop frequency or um, drop free world and treatment came from the SLT trial the, uh, that we conducted based in Moorfields, but at six sites across the country. And we had 718 patients, uh, pretty much open eligibility for anyone with primary open angle glaucoma or ocular hypertension, except for very severe disease. And we had 718 patients and we treated them to a particular target with SLT with a standard protocol, 360 degrees. And this, these were previously undiagnosed, no past medical um, treatment for um, glaucoma and no other um, ophthalmic eye disease under treat, under review. And we escalated the treatment. So in one arm on the left there, they had laser first and then went on to medical therapies. On the right, they went straight into medical therapy, that's drops, as in um, the, the sort of standard treatment paradigm of the last few decades. We screened a large number of patients to get the 718, so we made jolly sure that we hung on to them. We had 91% at the end of the three years, around about three quarters of those had glaucoma, of which two thirds were mild. Um, we looked at quality of life outcomes and they were very comparable between the two groups, as you um, might expect, because the majority of the medical treatment group were adequately controlled to a predefined target pressure with only um, two, uh, around two thirds on only one medication. The baseline um, um, uh, uh, characteristics of the two groups are very comparable. And the clinical outcomes are also very comparable in terms of pressure control and mean deviation because the pressure control was, um, we were treating increasingly intensively to a, uh, to a particular target. So you'd expect them to come out comparably. The number of visits at target were comparable. Um, the gross visual field, um, Disc um, deterioration, however, was slightly worse in the drops first group, even though we're aiming to treat to the same target and there were more cataract extractions in that group. But what was very striking were the greater number of trabeculectomies and those who were treated with drops first and the greater number of treatment escalations that were required. So when we looked at um, how they fared at the end of three years, we found that there were three quarters of patients were at their pre-specified target pressure um, without medication from um, the laser first group. So if they had SLT, some of those had a second SLT, around about um, a quarter, but of those patients who'd had SLT as their primary treatment, three quarters were drop free and at target pressure at the end of three years. So no need for medications, uh, uh, um, a comparable level of quality of life on the metrics that we've got, albeit relatively crude. And that came with um, very little risk because the laser itself was incredibly safe. There were no um, immediate or late uh, complications. There were no site threatening complications. And only one patient had a pressure spoke that required any form of treatment. They had one tablet of Diamox and that was it. Uh, these are the number of medications required. And so 78% of eyes or three quarters of patients were drop free. So some of the questions that we got on to ask, are, um, can we repeat the SLT? And we looked at those eyes that had failed, and we had 158 of those, but then went on to have a second laser. Um, on average, the treatment power was slightly greater. And here we've got that group of patients, these are the same group of patients at two different time points. The initial SLT um, over time had failed in the first 18 months, but when they had a repeat SLT, that extra laser seemed to have got them uh, their trabecular meshwork function back up and they had a much more prolonged pressure control achieving that target pressure. So not an arbitrary 20%, but a specific, eye-specific predetermined target pressure based on severity. So repeat SLT, not only did it work in the early failures within the first 18 months, but it seemed to work better. So I think it was a very exciting um, outcome from the study. 
We also looked at the economic valuation. Laser first was in fact more cost effective. So laser first gave drop free disease control, it was safe, no side effects, and I would propose should be considered for all newly diagnosed patients. We've got other findings that look at the specific um, number, uh, proportion of um, pressure reduction. And we've also very recently published and compared the visual field outcomes from the two groups, suggesting that the laser first treatment paradigm, probably because of compliance issues with the medication group, group um, actually gave better visual field preservation than did the use of medicine. So thanks to the local study group, sorry, I don't have time to um, evaluate, uh, um, enumerate them all, but the new treatment paradigm in the post light era, I think will be starting off with SLT, um, perhaps going on to a preservative free monotherapy initially, but then very rapidly moving on to minimally invasive glaucoma surgeries or possibly even injectable drugs, all of which are aimed at prolonged pressure control, but with minimal um, patient harm and minimum patient involvement. So thank you very much for that. Um, I look forward to questions from that at the end. Uh, we should move on from uh, that um, vision of the hopefully near future where we get away from multiple medication exposures um, and um, extensive preservative free, uh, and we're moving on to extensive preservative free um, monotherapies. And now we'll hear from um, Francesco Adone, who is going to talk to us about sort of optimizing the therapeutic management management of our patients and what insights we can get from the real world evidence that's out there. Thanks very much. Over to you, Francesco. Thank you, Gaz, for, for the nice introduction. And uh, so um, just start outlining what we will be talking about in the next few slides. So we will overview the relevance of real world evidence and the complementarity with randomized controlled trials. Uh, we will see why it's important to conduct and to get information from real world evidence trials. Then we will overview the visionary study key results and lesson learned. And then we will try to um, uh, view those results in the context of the situation related to the COVID virus we are uh, facing uh, during these times. Um, we Start gathering information uh, regarding new drugs uh, uh, when uh, during the drug development phase before the approval to uh, in input the, the drug itself in the in the market. And this is when drugs are tested in small and well-controlled patient populations. And this is done through interventional clinical trials, so the randomized controlled trials. Once get the approval. Uh, usually pragmatic clinical trials are uh, conducted to compare the effectiveness of two or more intervention in real world settings. And examples uh, of uh, pragmatic clinical trials are the light trial that we had just heard about by GAS and for example, the EAGLE trial. And in those trials, protocol dictates which approved drug the patients will receive. And after that, the drug is used in a large and less well-defined patient population over time. And so uh, at this time, uh, what takes place uh, is uh, what is called non-interventional uh, studies, uh, uh, where patients are already taking the drug and the protocol, the study protocol itself, dictates only what information to collect, but not what intervention the patient Will, uh, will be assigned to. So it's just an observation of what, what in real life uh, is happening. So these kind of studies, uh, of course, have a, a weaker internal validity compared to uh, the well-designed and well-structured uh, randomized control trials, but benefit for, for, from a, large, a larger generalizability. Uh, since sample being studied are representative of uh, much broader target populations. In, in fact, uh, limitations of randomized control trials uh, regards the fact that data from RCTs are limited for demonstrating an intervention's long-term safety and effectiveness or uh, its generalizability in different target population. 
And so there is a, an increasing need for additional insights on epidemiology, compliance, adherence, and costs in a realistic environment. And those kind of information uh, cannot be obtained through RCTs, but only uh, by using a real world data sources. And uh, uh, so real world evidence, if you want to try to, to conceptualize um, this, uh, this term, uh, can be defined as data that are collected outside the constraints of conventional explanatory or pragmatic randomized control trials. And uh, uh, also, uh, um, regulatory bodies uh, are increasingly uh, suggesting to conduct this kind uh, of studies. Uh, uh, this helps physicians uh, with their glaucoma treatment decision in their routine clinical practice. And there are a, a number of uh, sources of real world evidence. Among those sources, there are observational core studies. And uh, uh, the visionary study I would like to uh, um, uh, talk about at this point is one of uh, such observational perspective uh, 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 studies that was just published a uh, few, I mean, a few days ago in advances in therapy. And, uh, uh, the study uh, had as an objective to evaluate the efficacy, tolerability, and safety of the preservative-free tafluprost and timolol fixed dose combination in a real-world clinical setting in uh, adult people with open angle glaucoma or ocular hypertension, demonstrating insufficient response to topic topical beta blockers or prostaglandin analog, analog monotherapies. And the primary endpoint was the absolute mean intraocular pressure change from baseline to six months. There were a, a list of secondary endpoints. Among them, uh, there was the mean change of intraocular pressure from baseline, a responder rate, and uh, um, I mean, uh, safety and tolerability endpoints. Uh, the visionary study was a, a, a European multicenter study that involved 66 ophthalmology clinics across different countries and screened 721 patients. Uh, of those, uh, 577 completed the six months visits. And uh, this is a, a, um, a chart of the study design. So patients were uh, um, were visited at the baseline where intraocular pressure and uh, uh, tolerability endpoints were uh, measured and then were followed up for six months uh, with uh, uh, interim uh, visits at four weeks and 12, uh, 12 weeks. And uh, uh, so um, among the inclusion criteria, the only one I want to uh, highlight is that patients to be included in this observational period had to have insufficient intraocular pressure control with previous monotherapy that had to be either with beta blockers or prostaglandin analogs. And patients also had to be judged by their physician to benefit from a preservative-free eye uh, drop formulation. Uh, uh, here we see uh, what proportion of patients uh, was on PGA therapy that was 72% compared to 28% uh, of patients uh, uh, that are baseline were on beta blockers therapy. And this represents uh, uh, like a, uh, a breakdown of the, of the market of these two uh, uh, class of uh, hypotensive agents. And uh, here we have uh, the first uh, results regarding uh, the efficacy endpoints. Uh, mainly, uh, we can see that intraocular pressure from a, a baseline of 21.5 uh, dropped at month six uh, by 25%. That was 5.7 millimeters uh, of mercury. And this was regardless of previous treatment. This was maintained uh, from uh, week four to month six. Then we have a breakdown according to the baseline therapy that could have been either beta blocker or PGA. And as we can see, uh, uh, a drop, uh, drop of intraocular pressure of by 28% was observed in people previously uh, on beta blockers compared to a 23.6% in people uh, previously on PGA uh, monotherapy. Uh, so this demonstrated that the uh, fixed combination was uh, uh, effective uh, regardless of the class of hypotensive agent uh, used before. Uh, again, we have a, a breakdown according to the kind, to the type of uh, prostaglandin analog used uh, at baseline. And uh, we can see here 
that a significant reduction of intraocular pressure was maintained over six months, regardless of the kind of prostaglandin analog that patients were on before starting uh, the study. And the differences that you can see between the different uh, prostaglandin analogs here uh, very likely um, uh, are related uh, to the uh, differences in the baseline intraocular pressure, which was uh, uh, slightly higher in people that were previously in latanoprost compared, for example, to the other compounds such as traboprost. Uh, actually, uh, uh, approximately 7% of people had the uh, intraocular pressure reduced at least 20% from baseline, and uh, approximately 40% had a, a reduction of intraocular pressure of at least 30% from baseline. Uh, regarding uh, safety and tolerability, uh, coronary fluorescence score significantly improved uh, throughout the follow-up until the six months, uh, and uh, has improved uh, also the uh, tear breakup time, especially in those patients that were previously treated uh, with the prostaglandin analogs. Uh, in this uh, um, quite crowded uh, slide, actually what we want to, uh, to focus on our attention is uh, the red arrow pointing down that is showing the uh, reduction of uh, uh, patients that experience severe hyperemia which was completely uh, resolved for uh, those patients that were previously on latanoprost, bimatoprost, and travoprost monotherapies, and that reduced by 14% in those patients that were previously on tafloprost monotherapy. Uh, again, um, during the study, uh, patients were also uh, uh, asked about a, a range of subjective symptoms that were uh, reported to be significantly improved uh, by uh, 25 to 30 percent, and this regarded uh, dry eye sensation, uh, irritation, itching, and foreign body cessation. Um, uh, during the study, also uh, patients and physicians were asked about uh, their um, uh, their uh, uh, tolerability, their judgment, their subjective judgment about tolerability and the efficacy about the drugs. And uh, we can see uh, in this graph that uh, uh, um, almost uh, uh, more than 90% of patients uh, and physicians uh, at the six months uh, judged the treatment to be more effective uh, and more tolerated than what was previously uh, uh, ongoing. Uh, concerning the adverse events, uh, we can see that uh, more than 80% of patients experience no adverse events, and those patients that experience adverse events uh, experience uh, mild, uh, principally mild, 93% of patients uh, experience mild adverse events, and most of them, 71.3, resolved or were resolving at the end uh, of the study. Um, so what we can, uh, uh, I mean, try to summarize about what we have seen regarding the visionary study. That the visionary study reflects real life uh, clinical practice and uh, has a potential for clinically meaningful intraocular pressure reduction shortly after changing to preservative free tafluprost and timoral fixed combination from either a PGA analog or a beta blocker uh, uh, drug. And that uh, patients on all currently available PGA monotherapies may benefit from changing to this fixed combination therapy. Even patients consider intraocular pressure control gained an almost 20% further intraocular pressure reduction, reduction after uh, the shift. And uh, of course, uh, as uh, uh, any real world uh, study. It has uh, some study limitations. Uh, of course, uh, the observational nature of this uh, uh, data collection uh, has uh, intrinsic noise uh, that, of course, can limit the, the power of detecting some changes throughout the follow-up. Uh, the ethnicity was uh, mainly Caucasic, so the results cannot necessarily be extended to other ethnicities. A, and uh, of course, uh, the um, kind of uh, disease that was treated was open angle glaucoma and ocular hypertension, and, and we cannot uh, necessarily extend the results also to other forms of glaucoma. So uh, lastly, what 
can we learn from this study, which might be increasingly relevant during this current period of lockdown and restriction due to the uh, coronavirus? So we can say that having a tolerable and effective treatment uh, can reduce the likelihood of extra consultations related to either efficacy or tolerability issues. And this will be a benefit, uh, of course, for all patients, but especially for the higher risk populations, such as the age, elderly, glaucoma population. So uh, I would like uh, uh, to thank uh, all the uh, people that were involved in the visionary uh, study. Uh, here you see a list of principal investigators, but there are uh, as many uh, co-investigators uh, and, uh, and staff that were involved in this study. So thank to all of them and thank you for listening. Thanks very much indeed, Francesca. Uh, uh, a very um, reassuring, but also very tantalizing um, view of what can be achieved with with um, some very very powerful um, simple um, single treatment uh, preservative free um, um, preparations that are available to us now. So thank you. There are a few questions that have come in, which have come in from a number of different individuals. So it would be nice to touch on briefly um, a couple of very clinically orientated ones. Um, uh, one of the first of which was that um, given the risk from aerosol generating procedures, does that mean that we should be using non-contact tonometers? David, are you, do you have a view on this at all? I think there's, um, you know, there's some really interesting research out there looking at uh, alternative ways of measuring IOP. Um, I, 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 I think it's worth kind of looking at that. And obviously non-contact um uh seems to be you know in the current climate it would seem to have some advantages but i, I think i would um leave that, that opinion to my, my clinical colleagues maybe faisal perhaps yeah um i think there was a paper out from hong kong very recently from an um department saying that actually um things like air puff air puff tonometry and um uh the corneal hysteresis were yeah. air, aerosol generating devices and therefore actually we mm. were looking at it in regards to how we could do the monitoring service and quicker ways and safer ways to do it but actually i think it's counter to mm. say mm. that actually air, air, it is an aerosol generating procedure and therefore um mm. things like goldman and uh, goldman and uh, eye care and things are actually better so what, are they, what are they doing in italy um, actually, yes, I agree uh, to what has been just said that uh, the the eye path tonometry probably is not the 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 the, the technology of choice uh, for the aerosol generation potential. And the I mean, we are uh, mainly using uh, the Goldman applanation tonometry with very strict uh, rules about disinfection of the cones or using a single use disposable cones which are not very uh, uh, loved by the ophthalmologist mm -hmm. because the, the view is not so clear. And so tonometry can be very, very difficult, very tough. Uh, actually, I think that uh, the rebound tonometry, the eye care, uh, really has the potential to uh, solve a lot of these, uh, of these issues. There are clinics uh, in Europe that are running, uh, run, uh, were run in the past uh, uh, since years just with uh, the uh, rebound tonometry. I'm thinking about the uh, Anya Tulonen clinic in Tampere, for example. They use just eye care since long time. And I think that uh, it is uh, a reliable technique and is uh, uh, it uses uh, disposable tips. So I think it can be mm. really uh, a, a good choice. I, I would only put the caveat in of using eye care when, for instance, uh, you're using it as opposed to the slit lap microscope where we tend to have, we wear a mask, we have a shield guard, the patient's wearing a mask and so on. When you have the eye care, you're just lacking that shield that we have on the slit lamp as well. So it's a bit more direct. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the only caveat I'd yeah. add with the eye I care. I think what's it's interesting good. from the discussions, we've had a number of different discussion groups going on um, from sort of glaucoma service leads from Singapore, UK, um, and three or four sites in the States, Johns Hopkins, Baltimore and others. Um, it has been the, the real spread of um, opinion across the world. A number of people are, have, have set up eye care only stations. Uh, some people have steered clear of GAT because they are worried about um, the closeness of patient contact and um, um, breath exchange. 
Um, and then others are continuing with Aura-based devices and non-contact-based devices such as the Aura um, because of the um, concerns around aerosol generation are present, but the evidence for presence of um, uh, active viral particles other than just um, you know, RNA antigen, but actually infected viral particles in the um, conjunctival surface, on the conjunctival surface and in the tear strip um, is very weak. Um, I think, unfortunately, the honest answer is that none of us know. We're all making our own decisions based on what I was touching on, which was independent personal uh, or departmental views of, of risk assessment. Um, an interesting question from Peter Gray here. Um, this is directed to you, Faisal, but probably applies to all of us clinicians, which is that you mentioned that the social distancing will reduce the number of clinic patients in clinic. Um, where is everyone else going to go? <laughs> <laughs> well, there's an, well, well, firstly, we're going uh, to have to remodel the service anyway, because as we get more and more data, of course, college guidelines say that if a large significant patient population that we have in glaucoma ocular hypertensive so suspects. And the fact that we can get this data properly means that there'll be hopefully a, a significant, I don't know how large, we tend to be quite strict, but a significant number of patients who we think, well, we followed you up for five years, we can kick you out of clinic for a start. So you're making a bit of space for, for patients and they can be moved out into the community. But also it's a great way of introducing um, uh, models where we have community care, um, for looking over the lower risk patients. We may even be looking at, you know, the cataract, the, all our services. There's, we can't just stay glaucoma centric. And it may be that looking at functional loss will persuade the departments that actually we need to concentrate on those patients who are losing vision for, uh, for reasons that we can treat uh, properly rather than patients who have other conditions. And there may be a remodeling of our services whereby glaucoma, medical retina and so on have a large proportion of floor space. We certainly will have to go into the evenings looking at having more consultants so that we can have more sessions because we can have less patients per clinic, but also the telephone calls and so on. And if David Crabb's, you know, um, fields from home work, then that will again in increase the floor space in the hospital. So we're having to bring in patients less often. You can get eye care that you can do on your own at home. So you can buy an eye care tonometer at home uh, from the company and do your own eye care. It does have a Bluetooth connection. So theoretically, you could do your eye care and your visual fields at home. where well, you don't even need to come in then, uh, Gus. You can just do all your stuff at home. Uh, <laughs> the computer will say, yes, steady, yes, the patient is stable and reliable. And uh, you don't need to see them again. Or no, they're not reliable or they're not stable and they need to be seen by I you. I think this so, is probably the most exciting exciting time in ophthalmology, yeah. certainly for glaucoma, but you know some might differ. But some of them are the most exciting time in ophthalmology that we will see in our in our lifetimes, and certainly for generations. Um, I think we've got the opportunity to um, throw away the rule book, rip up what we've done before, refashion the whole of our services, um, probably better than it's ever been done. Uh, it's going to be a bloody hard work, but I think it's going to be, you know, a really, really exciting prospect. We've certainly uh, looking forward to transferring the bulk of our care to remote data collection. So asynchronous decision making, I think, is in the jargon where patients are seen at another time, at another place. And that data is then reviewed remotely and you let them have the information and the answer personally over the phone or possibly on a, a video conference call. So really exciting times. Uh, David's going to lead the charge, obviously, in in, in armchair based testing. Um, and I, but I think putting all of this together, it's going to be a different world in, in, in five years, but probably in two. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And I think there are already virtual models running where yeah, for many years, um, there are services with the, especially in glaucoma, with the monitoring services that are run by optoms or techs, whereby the patients are seen one day and they're reviewed by the consultant the following day. And we've been doing that at the Western for well over five, six years. And, and other units around the country in the UK have been doing that well over 10 years. Um, so th there'll be more and more of that happening. Yeah, of course. I mean, we've got we've got a, a Caden Street Optom led um, virtual data collection model that's been re running very well, seeing an increasing proportion of of the clinic um, over the last few years. And um, I'm hoping that we'll be able to um, push that well beyond half of the current 69,000 patients for which we're responsible. Um, yeah,
couple of patients, uh, a few questions coming in. The last few minutes, um, I, I realise that we're over time, so apologies to those of you who are still on the webinar but anxious to get on with supper or getting the kids to bed. Um, <laughs> I'm, 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 I've missed one and I'm avoiding the other. Um, but there are a couple of questions about SLT. Um, somebody asking, um, Jigs Patel asking if uh, SLT should be first line therapy instead of medical therapy. Um, I, I would say yes, wouldn't I? Because um, the trial showed it was effective and very and worked very well. What's going to be interesting is not what I say, but what NICE and the American practice patterns say. So the American Academy of Ophthalmology PPP guidelines are not yet published, uh, but the word on the street that I couldn't possibly mention to, um, but between you and me and uh, thousand people on the webinar, uh, there's a suggestion that they may be recommending it as first line use. Um, uh, the NICE guidance have uh, announced publicly that they will be rewriting NICE guidance for glaucoma based on the publication of the light trial data. Um, and so the presumption is that they will suggest that it should be offered to people as first line. And that is now our de facto standard, certainly at Morfields, for all of our new patients or indeed patients on monotherapy who are now offered it. Um, some of the other questions, um, uh, um, a question for Francesco, which was really, how do you think that sort of real world data um, will be, um, will fit in with the regulators? Do you think the regulators are lagging behind the ability of big data, real world data to um, change our practice? I mean, actually, uh, regulators are asking for, for real world data. I mean, they are a complement, of course, they are uh, complementary uh, to uh, data coming from a proper uh, randomized control trial. And I think that uh, 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 real world data has have the power to uh, to to change, uh, to change uh, the way regulators behave regarding um, regarding the drug policy. So if this was the question i think that uh, yes they have the power to change things of course uh, gas if I, I what i can add is just that uh, real data uh, are important but as i uh, showed in the graph at the beginning of my talk uh, they are uh, just information that come and uh, have sense after what has already been uh, got read through randomized controlled trials and pragmatic trials. So uh, data uh, from real world evidence just alone, they have no sense, no power to, to, to tell anything, of course. Right, thank you. So I think on, on that um, summary of, of sensible pragmatism, um, we should let everyone get on with their evening. Some apologies that we've run a little bit over time. Thank you to the organisers for um, letting us do that, because I think it gave us the opportunity to uh, really answer um, some of the more frequent questions that were coming in, and um, certainly some of the more clinically pertinent ones. So thank you very much, Faisal, David, Francesco. Um, it's been a pleasure. I look forward, I hope, to seeing you in person one day, not too distant future. And thank you very much to our audience for listening. Thank you very um, much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you thank very you. much.